Let's take the Lord's face together, please, and pray. Our gracious Father, we thank Thee for the privilege to join together in worship at the Lord's house this afternoon. We thank Thee for each one that has been able to come and to join with us. And we do look to Thee, O Lord, that we will know the Lord's help as we seek to lift up our Lord's name in believing worship. Oh Lord, we do pray that these homes that we have been singing of, that they would indeed be the homes of our congregation, that our homes will be set apart by godliness. Oh Lord, grant us thy help then as we seek to worship thee, we pray in our Lord's name. We're going to turn, please, in our hymn books to the hymn 15, the hymn number 15 on the page 181. Praise, praise ye the name of Jehovah our God, declare, O oh, declare ye his glories abroad. The hymn 15, page 181. It looks like I'm choosing Grace Bonner's hymns today. I didn't actually do that deliberately. Uh, but what great words again we have here in this hymn. We'll stand together as we sing. <laughs> Oh. 
Let's take the Lord's face again in prayer. Let's look to the Lord for his help tonight that we might truly know that fresh meeting with our God. Our gracious Father, we praise thee this evening for the privilege that we do have to come and bow together at thy feet. O oh Lord, we thank thee that we come as a blood-bought people, as a blood-washed people. We come as a purchased people, the purchased bride of the Lamb. And O oh Lord, we thank thee for his beauty. Our hearts rejoice tonight that the bride is attired in the righteousness of our blessed Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, we thank thee that as thou dost look upon thine own people, thou dost see us dressed in those white garments. We have been purified. We are declared right before thee. Therefore, we cast ourselves before thee we thank thee for a loving and a faithful husband, one who has never forsaken his bride, but one rather who loved the church and gave himself for it. And O oh Lord, we thank thee for that beautiful passage in Ephesians 5 that, remind, that reminds us that the husband nourishes and cherishes and we thank thee, Lord, that it is thy purpose to nourish and cherish thy church. And, O oh Lord, we pray that through the meeting this evening that we will be nourished afresh, that we will be very conscious that the Lord does hold us near. And, O oh Lord, we pray that we will even then be as John leaning upon the Lord's breast that tonight we might even hear as it were our Lord's heartbeat, that we might hear that beat of tender love afresh. And, O oh Lord, we pray that we might rise up from this gathering with that renewed desire to live for thee and for thine honour and glory. We give thee thanks for all that are met in thine house this evening and for those that join us online. And, O oh Lord, we look to Thee, that our hearts will be touched and blessed throughout this time. O oh Lord, we pray for a deepening walk with our God. We think of the words of the hymn writer, Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Oh, deliver us from backsliding. Deliver us from half-hearted Christian living. And we pray, dear Lord, that thou wilt come near to us this evening, and our hearts will again burn within us. We pray for any that listen to the message this evening that are still without thee. And, O oh Lord, we cry to thee that lost ones will be drawn unto thyself. We recognize that we are surrounded here by souls that are lost and dying, and souls that have no concern for their eternal state. Have mercy upon the lost, we pray. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that thou wilt make this little flock to be a bright witness in a dark place. Lord, we pray that thou wilt use us to the extension of thy kingdom. And O oh Lord, we pray that it will be our joy even to reach precious souls. So, Lord, grant us thy help here. Shut us in with thyself, for this time we do pray. We confess our sinfulness afresh before thee. Cleanse us afresh in thy sight. We do pray in the Lord's name. Amen. <coughs> We're going to turn to the hymn 521. 521. God made me for himself to serve him here 
with love's pure service and in the real fear. Of course, we have not been created to live for ourselves, but rather created to live for the Lord and to serve Him. And the fall deprived us of that ability, but praise God in the gospel, being able to get to live unto the Lord's glory. 521 again to stand to sing. from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. The sons of the prophets were uh, sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. He said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yeah, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he 
said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together, smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went on dry ground, went over on dry ground. It came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. He said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. It came to pass as they still went on and talked. Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and Parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen are off. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his old clothes and rent them in two pieces took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the, the bank of Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? When he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. When the sons of the prophets which were to view Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. They came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said unto him, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. As peradventure the spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. He said, You shall not send. When they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send. They sent therefore fifty men. They saw three days, but found him not. When they came again to him, for he tarried Jericho, he said unto them, Did I not say unto you, Go not? And will end there, knowing the Lord will. Add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. We're going to have the catechism at this point, and we've moved from the subject of justification to adoption. Question 74, and we'll repeat the answer, please. Together, what is adoption? Adoption is an act of the free grace of God in and for his only Son, Jesus Christ, whereby all those that are justified are received into the number of his children, have his name put upon them, the spirit of his Son given to them, are under his fatherly care and dispensations, admitted to all the liberties and privileges of the sons of God, Near heirs of all the promises and fellow heirs with Christ in glory. There are a number of passages in the New Testament that speak of our uh, adoption into the family of God. Uh, in John 1, we have in chapter 1 that well known uh, verse where we read, As many as received him, to them give he the power to become the sons of God even to them which believe on his name. And again, words I think that are very well known to us all in 1 John 3, 1 John 3, and the opening verses of that chapter, Behold, 
what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Verse 2, beloved, now are we the sons of God? And of course then in the epistles we have the word adoption actually used. Ephesians 1 verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. And evidently adoption is related to justification, though it is described separately in the word of God. Justification is a change in our legal status. Adoption we could say is a change in our personal status. In justification God is the judge, but in adoption, God is the Father. Justification, sorry, adoption rather, is described here as an act. And as I mentioned way back, we had the first questions on justification. Justification is an act. The word here was chosen very carefully by the writers of the Confession and Catechisms to contrast with sanctification. Sanctification is a process. But adoption is an act in that it takes place in a moment of time. And while for the lady giving birth, she may feel that uh, giving birth is something like um, a, a process, yet of course there is that moment when the child is not born and the moment when they are born. And so equally in adoption, there is a moment when they are not legally adopted and a moment when they are. And so even in the human level this is true and certainly in the spiritual, in a moment of time we are adopted as the Lord's. And being adopted, the Lord ministers to us to assure us of that adoption. And we read of that in Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, Galatians 4, and in the verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so, when the Lord makes us His children, the Lord also gives us the Spirit of His Son, the Holy Spirit, to come and to assure us that we are indeed His children. And being children, then we have rights as members of the family of God. And so this is surely why this language of adoption is used. That when a child is adopted, though by birth they did not have rights to the blessings of that particular family, now by adoption all of those rights are theirs. They are legally members of that family. They become inheritors. And so with us brought into the family of God, we have rights to that which before uh, we were obstructed from by our sin. But now in Christ we have rights to all that we have in our blessed Lord. May the Lord bless these few thoughts hearts. Thank you all for coming and joining with us this evening. We welcome you again in our Saviour's name and also those that are joining us online. We welcome you in our Lord's precious name. I don't need to go through the announcements. They're all in the church bulletin. And we'll come then to our offering hymn and it's the hymn 557. 500 and 57, when you feel weakest, dangers surround subtle temptations, troubles <clears throat> above. 557, and we'll remain seated at the beginning of the hymn. <laughs> Oh. 
that every day we will live our lives governed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, grant us thy help then in this season, we pray. Give that needed enablement of the Holy Spirit of God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The doctrine of Christ's ascension is one I think that is much neglected. A few years ago, I remember hearing a preacher refer to how he had preached a sermon on the ascension of the Lord and especially emphasizing that, that our Lord's ascension was bodily. And there was a Christian couple in the meeting. They came and they spoke to him after and they said that they had been attending church for years but they had never grasped the importance of that particular truth that Christ had to ascend bodily as our representative into heaven. And so we emphasize the cross and we must do it. We emphasize the resurrection and again we must. Yet it's important that we do not neglect the subject of our Lord's ascension and his present position in glory. In Ephesians 4 verse 8 Paul speaks about the importance of our Lord's ascension and he's actually quoting from Psalm 68, Ephesians 4 verse 8, wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And the Lord's ascension then was necessary for the giving of gifts unto men. And Paul goes on to describe what gifts are in view uh, and the gifts speaking of the ministry of God's word, the building up of God's people through the ministry of the word of God. Now in 2 Kings chapter 2 we have an historical account. So there literally was a time when Elijah went on this last journey with Elisha. There literally was a time when Elijah lifted the mountain and a path was made through the Jordan River in the opposite direction that it had so many years before when Joshua crossed the nation. So Elijah lifted the mantle, he and Elisha crossed. And then there literally was this event when Elisha and Elijah were parted by the chariots of fire and Elijah taken to heaven in a whirlwind. So this was a literal historical event. And yet, I think as we read this chapter, we have to see that it is full of what we call typology. It is pointing us forward to great events. For as we think here of the taking of Elijah to heaven, the taking of Elijah to heaven did not end the work of God. God's work went on through the ministry of Elisha. And I think it's almost impossible to miss then the significance of this. That it is pointing forward to our Savior ascending. So in Acts chapter 1, remember how our Lord went out to the hill with his disciples and remember how there was that angelic activity that day. Our Lord was taken up into heaven. And remember then, Elisha, just as he tarried in Jericho after this, the disciples were to tarry in Jerusalem. There was then, after that time of tarrying, the going forward in the work of God. The Lord's work went on. So yes, Elijah was taken away, but the Lord's work went on. Our Savior ascended to glory, but the apostles continued the, the work of the gospel. And of course, that work continues right until this very day. And therefore we can see here is this typology 
that Christ has been taken up into heaven, but the work of God on earth goes on, on the basis of our Lord's ascension. But then surely we're also reminded here that as Elijah ascended to glory, there was this promise surely being made to Elisha, you will follow me to glory. Now Elisha would not go, of course, in the same way. And Elisha would die uh, as you and I will die, except the Lord comes first. Uh, and yet, Elijah being taken up into glory, surely there was this promise, you will be received up into glory. And therefore, here again, is this lesson for us, that as Christ has been received into glory, there is the promise that his people will follow. He is the forerunner. And so our Savior has been taken bodily into glory. Our souls at the moment of death will be taken into glory. But then there's that great resurrection day that still is to take place. When those that are alive and remain when our Lord comes, they will arise bodily. And for those that have died, their bodies will rise to be reunited with their souls. And therefore, this last journey of Elijah and Elisha, and what Elisha witnessed in the parting, have very important lessons for you and I in this year 2022. And therefore, I want us to look at this subject, living in light. Ascension. Elisha was to live the rest of his days in light of what happened in 2 Kings 2. We are to live the rest of our days in light of our Lord's ascension into glory. I want to see first of all that there is this lesson that we're to follow the Lord faithfully until the parting from this earth. For in this scene, in 2 Kings chapter 2, we have Elijah and Elisha walking together. And Elisha is determined that they will remain together until the moment of parting. Now the parting comes. But when the parting comes, Elisha for the rest of his days, here is the challenge. Walk with the Lord as you walked with the prophet. And therefore, Surely for the disciples in our Lord's ministry, they followed the Lord, not entirely faithfully, but they followed the Lord right until the ascension. And there was that lesson, you're to continue to walk with God. You're to follow the Lord faithfully until our parting from the earth. Now, it does seem clear in the chapter that Elijah knew that he was to be taken Away. I think verse 1 is suggesting that to us. It came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And so he talks then about these different steps in the journey. Elisha evidently is aware that Elijah is to be taken because when the sons of the prophet say to him, Your master is going to be taken away. He says, I know it. Hold your peace. So Elisha is conscious of it. Before Elijah is taken to heaven, there is this journey from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan. Now, this journey has to have some significance. Because when Elijah is going from Gilgal, and he starts there, at least that's where our record starts, and he ends then crossing the Jordan, the route from Gilgal to Jordan is not going by Bethel and Jericho. When he went to Bethel, he was going away from the river. So Gilgal was near the Jordan River. Remember when the children of Israel back in the book of Joshua had crossed the river 
they came to Gilgal, and, and that's where the covenant was renewed, and there was the reenacting of circumcision, and so on. So Gilgal is actually near the Jordan. But he brings him in this whole loop, as it were. And so there's some significance in all of this. And I think we have to pay heed to the, the historic references to these place names that are brought before us here. Now why did Elijah say in each place, stay here? I believe, and this is the view of most of the commentators, it was a test. You see, Elisha could not stay in Gilgal. He could not stay in Bethel. He could not stay in Jericho. Elisha had to cross the Jordan with Elijah. And how do we know that? Because it wasn't until they crossed the Jordan that Elijah said to him in verse 9, ask what I shall do. But that question was crucial because it was then that Elisha was asking for the double portion. So if he never crossed the river with them, he didn't have the opportunity to ask. So he had to go. And also, he had to receive the mantle. Elijah would use that to cross the river. So how was Elisha going to get the mantle unless he crossed the river with him. Of course, the mantle signified something more important than the fabric. And yet he had to have this evidence he was the true successor of Elijah. So given these details, it is clear this was a test. And the test was this. Will you stop short of God? Or will you persevere? Will you keep on going? As I mentioned this morning in the adult class, it's not that the Lord needed to find out something new when he tests. But the Lord does test us for our own good. And so it was here. And as I've mentioned then, it's not really difficult to see that these place names must carry some great spiritual significance. And so it begins at Gilgal. That was the place of beginnings for Israel as a nation living in the promised land. It was after they crossed the Jordan that they came to Gilgal and there was a renewal of circumcision, the reminder of God's covenant, and the name Gilgal has to do with rolling away. And at, rolling, or sorry, at Gilgal, there was a rolling away of reproach. A rolling away of reproach. And that place really stands as a reminder then of conversion. A new start. And perhaps it's no surprise then that Gilgal in Hebrew is related to the word Golgotha. And so while that might not here entirely evident in English. Uh, remember that the Hebrews, they focus on the consonants. And so you'll see that Gilgal and Golgotha, they share these consonants. And so Calvary, Golgotha, is the place of beginning. So there's this place of beginning. You start at Gilgal, but then you go to Bethel. Bethel, of course, means the house the Lord, the house of the Lord. It's a place in the Old Testament that has to do continually with the altar. It has to do with consecration. Remember how Jacob made that vow the first time he came to Bethel. Before him, Abraham had built altars at Bethel. In Genesis 35, when Jacob was at Bethel later, in life, there was the putting away of idols. Okay. So Bethel's the house of God. It's the place of consecration. Then Jericho surely speaks of battle. It speaks of victory. Remember how for the Lord's people in crossing the Jordan River in the days of Joshua, Jericho was the first great fortified city they came to. So it speaks of battle. 
And then the Jordan speaks of death and its resurrection. Death to self. Some see in all of this a reminder of Elijah's own life. He was beginning, as it were, spiritually speaking, in his guilt of conversion. He was brought to the place of consecration. He was a man who battled for the Lord at Jericho. If ever there's an example of one who denied self, surely it is Elijah. So Elijah's life is illustrated here. But some also see a reminder of Christ's life. And Gilgal, remember, circumcision. Our Lord was circumcised eight days old. We read of that significant event when our Lord was 12. He went to the house of the Lord, Bethel. Where, of course, it was Jerusalem our Lord went to. He faced Jericho. Remember, Jericho was associated with the curse. The Lord lived in a world of the curse. Then he came to Jordan to his death. But certainly for us, it has this idea of keep going on with God. Begin a conversion. There has to be a rolling away of your approach. There has to be a beginning of walk with God. There is to be that consecration. You have to battle. You have to die to self. And we're never to get stuck. But we're always to be moving on. And surely in this passage we have some of the most beautiful words in Scripture. At the end of verse 6, they too went on. They too went on. And isn't this to be an illustration of the child of God and his Saviour? Oh, that it were so that it be said of us, they too went on, that believer and his Lord, walking together, progressing. If you could turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 3. And we have in this chapter the great emphasis on the need for the Lord's people to be progressing. We're not to stay at Gilgal. We're to move on to Beth. We're to move on to Jericho. We're to move on to Jordan. Philippians 3, and in verse 8 it says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done, but ways, that I might win Christ, and be found in him. Verse 10, that I may know him. Of course, Paul already knew Christ, and yet he's praying that I might know more of him. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Verse 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. And he says, not as though I had already attained, he's saying, I, I can't say in my Christian life I've arrived. I haven't done all that the Lord would have me to do. There is more yet. And so what am I to do? I follow after. I'm to be like Elisha saying, I cannot leave. I have to keep following on after the Lord. And so in verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth on to those things which are before. Where there have been failures, forget them. Press on, I press on, verse 14, toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, all of these statements are, of course, a sermon in themselves, but if you go then to verse 20, our conversation, or more accurately, our citizenship is in heaven. 
From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he has ascended there. Verse 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Isn't Philippians 3 really explaining the significance of 2 Kings chapter 2? They too went on. We are to keep on going in our Christian lives. We have not arrived. Our Savior has ascended into heaven. And we're looking for him because he's coming again. And we will ascend. He will change our vile body. And Paul is saying in Philippians 2, until that day, keep following. Keep pressing on. I read yesterday about the origin of that Christian song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I've never known before the background to those particular words. In 1904, a Welshman missionary was laboring among tribal people in India. And the people he was laboring among were headhunters. But he had the privilege of seeing a family one for Jesus Christ. When the chief of one of the villages heard about this conversion, about the man and his family being converted, a village meeting was called and the, the man was summoned, the convert was summoned. And the chief demanded, stop following Jesus. That man replied, the convert replied, no. I have decided to follow Jesus. I am not turning back. The chief was furious. He killed the children man. The chief again then said, stop following Jesus. And the convert replied, though none go with me, I will still follow. No turning back. The chief was enraged. He killed the man's wife. He said to him again, now stop following Jesus. The believer looked the chief in the eyes, he said, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. No turning back. Those words then became a Christian song, not first in English, though of course we know them in English. May this be our desire, and pressing on, no turning back. So, living in light of the ascension, follow the Lord faithfully until our parted from the earth. I want to say then, secondly, Christ's ascension is vital to the progress of his church. Christ's ascension is vital to the progress of his church. We're going back to what I said at the beginning. Elijah in this passage is so clearly a type of our Lord Jesus Christ in his ascension up to the Father's right hand. And Elisha then, continuing on in the work of God, is a great type of the church. So the head was taken up. And remember, that's how Elijah was described by the sons of the prophets in the chapter. They were saying at these various places, do you not realize that your master is going to be taken from your head today? So the head would be taken up to heaven, but the work of the Lord went on. And Elisha then had this recognition before Elijah was taken. I need the power of God to be able to do the work that the Lord has called me to. And therefore, that's why he requested the double portion at the end of the verse 9. Now there are a number of significances in that request of the double portion. The double portion 
was that which was given by a father to his eldest son. And Elisha then was really requesting to be identified as the prophet's son. The double portion was the inheritance of the eldest. Now Elisha was not requesting anything physical. He was not asking for houses or lands. He was requesting the power of the Spirit of God. But in that he was requesting to be known in a sense as Elijah's son, as Elijah's successor. And therefore as he asks for the double portion which they've said is the portion given to the eldest son, when Elijah is taken, remember how Elijah said this is a hard request but if you see me then it will be granted. And verse 12, Elisha saw it, he did see it, and he cried, my father, my father. And he's really saying, the Lord has granted the request, I am identified as the son of the prophet. And in that sense, the successor, I will carry on ministry. And therefore it was vital for him to lift that mantle. For it symbolized the spirit and it symbolized the ministry that had taken place and that was to take place. Elijah took that up, the work would go on. So it was a request to be identified as the prophet's son and a request for the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, keeping in mind that the double portion was the inheritance, it doesn't mean that Elisha would have double of the power of the Spirit that Elijah had. You think of the father giving the double portion to the son, the son doesn't have double what the father had. That's not the point in the double portion. And yet it's interesting that for Elisha, in his ministry, there is a sense in which there's a doubling. Because if you follow through the miracles of Elijah, and then look at the miracles of Elisha, Elisha's are double in number. A.W. Pink talks about that at length and length in his commentaries on Elijah and Elisha. Now remember the typology here. Elijah is a type of the ascending Christ. Elisha, a type of the church. The double portion is to be upon us. And therefore there's a sense in which we, like Elisha, are to do greater things. We, like Elisha, are to do greater things. If you could turn with me then to John 14. And we have a verse here that sometimes troubles the Lord's people. And they wonder how this can be true. And yet, of course, the Lord's spoken and therefore it is true. John 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. And the question we have to ask is, how could the disciples, and then the church generally, do greater works than Jesus Christ? Now, evidently, it's not talking in the sense of stilling storms or multiplying creating bread. And so we think of Elisha's ministry. Elisha didn't have a Mount Carmel. And so in that sense, Elisha's ministry was not greater than Elisha's, just as in this sense of stilling storms, multiplying bread, our ministry is not greater. Or the apostles' ministry, for that matter, was not greater than the ministry of Jesus Christ in that sense. So it's not talking about the miracles in their number 
in their power or their wonder, for though the apostles certainly did work miracles, they were not as numerical, they were not as spectacular as the miracles of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you read the book of the Acts of the Apostles, there's no feeding the 5,000. There's no raising of Lazarus after being dead four days. So what is this? Well, thinking about the apostles, their miracles were greater in the sense that they were over a wider geographical area. Our Lord's miracles were restricted, and of course we don't undermine them in any way. The Lord himself is saying here that there was this lesser thing. The Lord's miracles were primarily within Israel itself. But the miracles of the apostles, they went further geographically. And that geographical uh, matter is the, is the important detail here. For the works here are not only miraculous works. If you look back with me in John chapter 5, getting away from 2 Kings 2 and yet I think it's important to show you this. John chapter 5 and verse 20. The context here is the healing that there had been at the pool. John 5 20. The father loved the son and showed him all things that himself do. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. And so the miracle of the healing of the man at the pool was a greater work. Yet the Lord said there will be greater works. Verse 21, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. And the resurrection that's in view there is conversion. As we see in verse 24, it's talking about those that pass from spiritual death to spiritual life. The greater works, then, are conversions. Now, the apostles and you and I cannot work conversions. And yet, there are greater works in this sense of the physical extent of Christ's kingdom. It has gone far beyond the physical confines of Israel. The physical extent and also the numerical extent. Remember how in Acts chapter 1, after the Lord's ascension, we just have a handful there, 120. And yet, when Pentecost came on Pentecost itself, 3,000 converted. Greater works than these. Now, coming back to John 14 and verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. Now, many times we get this idea, and it's completely wrong. We get this idea, the work of God goes on, despite the fact that Christ isn't here. But our Lord said, the work of God goes on, because he is not here physically. The work of God goes on because Christ is in heaven. It's on that basis. And that's what's being taught to Elisha in 2 Kings 2. The work will go on because Elijah is in heaven. And there will be these greater works. Elisha will witness wonderful things in his ministry. Because Elijah has ascended. And the key, of course, to it all is that the Holy Spirit came upon Elisha in such a mighty way. And is that not our need tonight? The Lord would say to us, as Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee. Have we prayed today, Lord? Give me a greater measure of the Holy Spirit. We cannot have double of the Spirit of what Christ had. The Lord had the Spirit without measure, could not be measured. 
Therefore, this double portion is of sin. It has to do with the inheritance. The Lord does give the Spirit to them that ask. Remember here, Elisha, he received this double portion because he felt his need. It isn't that part of the problem in the work of God today. We don't feel our need as we ought to. We go on our own strength. But there'll only be these greater works. We'll only see the work of God go forward in our day as we feel our need of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit of God. May we learn then from Elisha to that end. May we have that desire for more of the Lord. So living in light of the ascension, follow on until our parting. Christ's ascension is vital to the progress of his church. And then finally, we are to live with an awareness of the unseen. In verse 12, it says, It came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. I never thought of this until I came to prepare this particular message. But remember in 2 Kings chapter 6, there is that siege of Samaria. And when the servant of Elisha wakes up in the morning, he sees the enemy. And he cries out, alas, my master, what shall we do? 2 Kings 6, 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. So when the servant awoke, the horses and chariots of fire were there, but he didn't see them. The Lord opened his eyes to have that gaze into the unseen. Now going back then to 2 Kings 2 and the verse 11, doesn't it make sense that the chariot of fire and the horses of fire here were also in the realm of the unseen? And this is why Elijah is saying, if you see it, if the Lord opens your eyes to see the unseen today, and doesn't it also explain why the men that had stood on the other side of the river and had watched wondered if the body of Elijah had been dropped somewhere? And it certainly gives the, the impression to me that they saw the body rise, but they couldn't really explain it. Because they didn't see the chariots of fire that had parted Elijah from Elisha. So Elisha here, and I believe that his eyes opened, saw into this realm of the unseen. And as in 2 Kings 6, he saw the Lord is the great warrior. Because isn't that what the, the horses and chariots are speaking of? The children of Israel were never encouraged to have horses and chariots. Some trust in chariots and horses. We will remember the name of the Lord. The chariots of fire and horses of fire then are speaking of how the Lord it is as the Bible describes him, the man of war. He fights on his people's behalf. And as the Lord and the angelic beings are with his people, we are enabled to be used of him. And so in verse 11, Elisha, he sees the chariot of fire, the horses of fire. As verse 12 says, Elisha saw it. And what does he cry out? He says, my father, my father, 
the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And I have seen into the world of the unseen. The Lord is our warrior. And yet he says, Elijah, Elijah my father, he's the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. That is, through the ministry of Elijah, he was the greatest weapon in the nation. He was the greatest soldier. And of course, Ahab never acknowledged that to be so. But this nation had been spared the judgment of God on account of a godly prophet. Why was the nation still in existence? Because God still had a godly man in it. Elijah was the true chariot of Israel and horseman as the Lord was with him, working through him. Now, the title of this point then, we are to live with an awareness of the unseen. Remember how Paul talked to us about how we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There is a wicked world of the unseen. But then we're also to have this realization. The Lord is on the side of his people. The Lord fights us for us. And like that servant then, our eyes are to be opened up, not that we actually literally see the, the chariots of fire as the, as the servant got to see there, but that by faith we would be ever conscious that the Lord and his forces are on our side. And as we think then of how our Lord has ascended to glory, there is a battle of the answer. We're not to be in despair. For surely, as the chariots and as the chariot of fire and the horses of fire parted these two, Elisha was conscious that they remained with him. Isn't that what 2 Kings 6 shows us? He saw them there at Jordan. And that morning when the servant was crying out, Alas, Master, what shall we do? Elisha was conscious. The chariots and the horses are still there. The Lord is still with us. Praise God today, though our Saviour has ascended to glory, the Holy Spirit is with us and thereby ministering Christ to us. The heavenly host surrounds us. May we then press on in the work of God as Elisha was taught here in this chapter. May it be the case that we too go on. May the Lord take his word this evening and bring it upon our hearts. Amen. We'll sing a couple of verses of 520 in closing. 520, go labor on. Spend and be spent thy joy to do. The Father's will it is the way the Master went, should not the servant tread it still. We'll, we will sing the verse 1, 5, and 6, and then remain standing for closing prayer. Verses 1, 5, and 6.
pray that thou wilt enable us to labor on, to keep on serving thee until that day that we shall be parted from this scene of time. We thank thee for that great assurance that we too will rise. At the moment of our death, our souls will be with Christ, and there will be that great reunion on the day when our Saviour shall come again. O oh Lord, we thank thee that our risen Saviour is not dead, but as he said, Behold, I am alive, I was dead, behold, I am alive forevermore. O oh Lord, write thy word upon our hearts, and we pray that we will be enabled to serve thee in a dark and evil day. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, Present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. 